February 1st, 1979. Interstate 196, Van Buren County, Michigan. The state of Michigan was experiencing cold winter weather, with temperatures dropping as low as negative 6 degrees centigrade or 21.2 degrees Fahrenheit. A thick blanket of snow covered the ground for as far as the eye could see, with some areas even being covered in as much as 16.9 inches. It was vital for the local communities and economies for the snow to be cleared from the main roads, and so a task force of snowplows were deployed. One of these snowplows was tasked with clearing the snow from the I-196 in Van Buren County, and as they went about their job that February morning, they would stumble upon a horrifying discovery. The naked remains of a woman dumped next to the highway. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this case, I'd just like to thank Ava's Manor for sponsoring this episode. It is with the support of sponsors such as Ava's Manor that we are able to continue posting true crime content, so please don't hesitate to give them your full support. Ava's Manor is a multi-level game which follows the story of Ava Mendez. Ava Mendez is a successful mystery writer whose life changes when a long-lost relative of hers goes missing and leaves their estate in her name. Ava's Manor is free for you to download using my link below, and I highly recommend playing. I find it the perfect way to wind down after a long day. In the game, you help Ava uncover the truth behind the mysterious disappearance of her relative by following the trail of clues while also stopping the estate from being demolished by the city. Ava's Manor is a great way for you to train your brain. You can challenge yourself with puzzles and also express your inner creativity with the ability to personalize each room in the manor in your own interior decorator style. Unleash your inner interior decorator. Don't forget to use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments to download Ava's Manor for free and truly let your creativity flow. Now, back to the case. Jeanette Marie Chandler was born on the 29th of May 1956 in Muskegon County, Michigan, to parents Glenna and James Chandler. Janet had a younger brother, Dennis, and was described as being a caring person, full of life, and from a young age, had a love for children. She was born into a conservative Christian family attending church regularly, and before she'd even graduated from high school, Janet had found work at a daycare, the perfect place for someone with such a love for children to work. Janet also works with Child Evangelism, which is a Bible-centered organization composed of born-again believers whose purpose is to evangelize boys and girls with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to establish them into the world of God and in a local church for Christian living. She worked with child evangelism over one summer during high school, going about her local community and ultimately making friends with all those who she came across. All throughout her childhood, Jeanette was taught to play the piano, and whenever she practiced, she would sing along. One time she was practicing and singing, and we looked out and all the neighbors were standing in the street. She had a very... Um, strong voice. She was mezzo-soprano, and so that's a, a little lower range, but she was very strong in her voice. Jeanette's childhood was described by those who knew her as being somewhat strict. She was forbidden from attending sleepovers in homes where alcohol was consumed, so if her friend's parents drank alcohol, she was banned from going to their place. Despite this, Jeanette was fairly outgoing at school. 
She dated just a handful of boys, but the relationships never went further than a quick kiss. After graduating from high school, Jeanette went on to study at a nursing school, though her experience there was not something that she enjoyed. She found herself surrounded by, quote, wild students who would drink a lot and go against the values that she had been raised with. As a result, Jeanette dropped out. The environment at the nursing school made her feel extremely uncomfortable and unable to focus on her studies. Following that, she decided to enroll at Hope Community College in Holland, Michigan, to study music. Jeanette started at the community college as a conservatively dressed freshman, someone who was not in any way prepared for the other students' weed-smoking lifestyles. There was with most young adults who've had a strict upbringing. Jeanette started to break the boundaries. It was at this community college that Jeanette would meet a middle-aged man who would seduce and arguably manipulate her into having sex with him. And Jeanette would ultimately end up entering a year-long relationship with this middle-aged man, sneaking him into her family's home twice a week when her parents went in the house. As a means as to pay her way through college, Jeanette applied for and landed a job as a night clerk at the Blue Mill Inn. The Blue Mill Inn, now known as the Economy Inn, was located about a five minute drive away from the Hope College, where Jeanette studied and so it was the perfect place for her to earn some money in between studies. Jeanette's roommate, Laurie Swank, was actually a manager at the Blue Mill Inn, so the job was somewhat of a breeze for her. It was really easy for her to apply and get accepted for this job. And it was from her job as a night clerk at the Blue Mill Inn that Janet would vanish. It was just after two o'clock Wednesday morning when the Blue Mill Inn was robbed of about $500 and hotel clerk Jeanette Chandler was missing from the office. She was on the phone to a hotel security guard who heard the robbery in progress and called the police. Authorities had no concrete evidence Chandler was abducted until this morning. It was about 1.30 this morning when a snowplow driver was traveling through this turnaround just south of South Haven on I-196 and he noticed tracks leading into the woods. When he investigated, he found the partially snow-covered nude body of a woman. Tracking dogs were brought out immediately to comb nearby woods and sides of the road for the woman's clothes. Helicopters also searched the area for clues. Tire tracks were studied and state police say they did not fit the description of the four-wheel drive Jimmy that was suspected earlier, but were car tracks. It wasn't until noon that the Hope College music students' parents were brought down to South Haven to identify the body as that of Jeanette Chandler. An autopsy has been completed, but police would not confirm or deny reports that Chandler had been strangled. Police admit they still don't have much to go on, no suspects yet and no good leads. We have received uh, a number of calls. Uh, anytime you have a, a major crime, you do get people calling in, even with hunches and, and uh, reports of uh, people out or, or, or you know, peculiar uh, goings on. And we have received some of those kinds of information. Of course, uh, they are being investigated. There's a large cadre of investigators being assigned to each and every aspect of the case and lead. And, uh, you know, they, uh, you always do get a number of these kinds of, uh, of leads, but if you will. Uh, no. An autopsy confirms that Janet Chandler had been strangled to death and that there had been indications on her body of recent sexual activity. The police immediately began to question Jeanette's friends and family to try to see if she had any enemies or if she had said anything strange in the lead up to her murder. But they uncovered no leads. In the months that followed, the investigators questioned Jeanette's co-workers and the guests that had stayed at the Blue Mill Inn in the lead up to and during Jeanette's kidnapping and subsequent murder. They compiled over a thousand pages of notes in this case, but they found absolutely no leads. They were no closer to finding out who had been responsible for Jeanette's death months after it had happened than they were the day her body was found. And this lack of leads eventually saw the case begin to grow cold before being filed as an unsolved cold case. And the case lay dormant 
packed away in storage with no justice being served for more than two decades before any progress would be made. And that progress would come in the form of a Hope College film class in September of 2003. The professor of the film class decided to make Jeanette Chandler's case the subject of the class's documentary in the hopes that it might jog memories and with a mission to keep Jeanette's story and memory alive. I've used clips from this documentary in this episode, and you can find a link to watch it in full down in my sources. The film instructor, the professor, had come across Jeanette's story in the spring of 2003, when he'd been interviewing a detective who was retiring from the force. The professor asked the detective if there was a case that still haunted him to that day, and the detective responded by pointing at a picture of Jeanette that had been on the bulletin board at the police station since 1979. The film class had four months to create the documentary, and so immediately went to work trying to learn the history of Holland and what was going on there in the late 1970s. And they learned that in the winter of 1978, nearly 200 union members that worked at the local Chemitron paint plant went on a massive strike. The strike crippled the paint plants, and strikers from Detroit travelled to Holland to participate in the strike on the picket line. And as a result of this, the paint plant hired the Wackenhut Security Company to protect guards who opened the gates for the employees that were not participating in the strike. The protesters taunted the guards and vice versa. It was an environment of tension. And unfortunately, both the protesters and the hired security stayed at the same motel the Blue Mill Inn, which was just a few miles away from the paint plants. There were approximately 80 security guards staying at the Blue Mill Inn, along with the protesters from Detroit, and in the bar next door to the motel, the wives and the girlfriends of the men that worked at the paint plants were waiting for them. It, it was such a tense atmosphere to have all these people who were had different ideas and were protesting for different things all in the same place. You can imagine some heated arguments that would have occurred. As a result of this documentary that was made uh, by this film class in 2004, detectives began to rework Jeanette's case. But it wouldn't be until September of 2006 that the full truth of what had happened to Jeanette would finally be revealed. The investigators that had began to re-examine this case after the student documentary had been published in 2004 began to question the people that had been within Jeanette's life. They paid a visit to the middle-aged man that Jeanette had dated for a year, who in 2004 was now a senior citizen and had expressed how ashamed they were of what they'd done. Quote, he isn't proud of the relationship that he had with Jeanette and feels he may have taken advantage of her crush on him. The investigators spoke with a woman who had known Jeanette since she was a kid, and she told them that following this relationship with this middle-aged man, Jeanette's religious views changed because she realised that if she sinned, she wouldn't be immediately going to hell. Two days after talking to the middle-aged man, the investigators flew to Pennsylvania to speak with Jeanette's old roommate and boss, Laurie Swank. Laurie, in 2004, was in her 40s and was working as a nursing assistant at a local hospital. When Laurie was asked about Jeanette, she spoke only positive things, about Jeanette being musical and fun-loving, though when she was shown a photograph of Jeanette and several of the security guards, her mood quickly shifted. Laurie told the investigators that the security guards were a wild group who liked to party, claiming that Jeanette had affairs with the guards and admitting that she'd even had sexual relations with them too. She told them about an occasion where she had to tell Jeanette off for using one of the display rooms to have sex with one of the security guards. The investigators then returned their focus on the men who'd been at the Blue Mill Inn during the strike, in particularly the man who had phoned the police to report the robbery, a man called Robert Lynch. Robert Lynch had been 39 years old when Jeanette had been abducted and had built himself a respectable life in a town 80 miles away from where the murder had taken place following the abduction. Robert Lynch had opened a beauty school with his wife and had raised two kids. When the investigators spoke with him, he had been 65 years old. But something wasn't right with him. Something seemed off. He was heavily drinking on the daily. Was he trying to forget something? The investigators interviewed Robert Lynch multiple times, and eventually, he began to open up. 
He told the investigators that he had been intimately involved with Jeanette and that they had rendezvoused at a dark and vacant house. Robert Lynch then dropped a bombshell. He told the authorities that Jeanette had been at a party on the night she was murdered with some of the security guards and that the party, quote, went haywire. This was the first time that anybody had ever mentioned a party happening on the night of Jeanette's murder. In that 20 plus years, nobody had mentioned it. The investigators were immediately interested, but when they tried to delve deeper, Robert Lynch went quiet. The detectives decided to pay Robert Lynch a visit 11 days later for a follow-up, and they found Robert Lynch in a somewhat reflective mood. He told them about how he had visited his father on his deathbed shortly before Jeanette's abduction. Quote, I regret my whole life. Some of the things I've done, I don't even want to talk about. The detectives asked Robert Lynch whether he believed in karma, telling him that they thought that he drank to forget something. After a few moments had passed, Robert Lynch replied, quote, I'm not drinking to forget, I'm running from everything. Over the course of the next three months, the investigators continued to interview Robert Lynch. They had a gut feeling that he knew something that could break the case. And that breakthrough came when the detectives started to play the DVD of the student film who killed Jeanette Chandler. Robert Lynch began to fight tears as the documentary played. The detectives told him, quote, you have a daughter Jeanette's age. If she were killed, wouldn't you want to know what happened to her? It was then that Robert Lynch began to break and told them everything. Now, there are several characters within this case which make it a little bit confusing, so I'll try to keep it as simple as I can. There are a lot of names involved. Now, I have mentioned Laurie Swank before, Jeanette's 21-year-old roommate and the manager of the Blue Mill Inn, who had been the one to get Jeanette the job there. And we've spoken about how Jeanette had accepted a job there on the overnight shift as a front desk clerk. Now, there are some characters from the hired security for the paint plants that also play a role, one of which was Wackenhut Security Force Supervisor Arthur Paver, who wasn't actually staying at the Blue Mill Inn, but instead in the guest house at the Chemtron paint plants. Now, this guest house will play a significant role within this case. It's also important to discuss the relationships within the Blue Mill Inn that quickly forms between the staff members at the motel and the group of security guards staying there. A group of security guards that drank a lot and partied hard. Some of the security guards began to engage in sexual and intimate relations with Laurie Swank, desk clerks and housekeeping staff. The majority, if not all, of these relationships were non-monogamous, meaning that they were not exclusive. A security guard called James Nelson had been seen numerous times groping Jeanette in public and making comments about sexual acts that he wanted to do with her. It's unclear to what extent Jeanette rejected these comments, but what we do know is that the sexual relations and comments between the security guards and the motel staff naturally created an environment of jealousy and this jealousy fostered anger from predominantly the female employees at the Blue Mill Inn. Jealousy and anger that they directed towards Jeanette Chandler. One of the maids at the Blue Mill Inn confronted Jeanette that night in the hallway in a rage on the night that she was abducted, as the maid had heard that Jeanette had been secretly seeing her boyfriend, who was one of the security guards. Jeanette reportedly had phoned the guard's room and asked him to come to the front desk, and when he did, she had been in the adjacent showroom completely naked, bar a pair of cowboy boots. The maid and Jeanette had argued with such anger that they could be heard throughout the motel. Laurie Swank, Jeanette's roommate, had also been told that Jeanette had slept with the head security guard, Arthur Paver. Laurie had a crush on Arthur Paver and was furious that she had slept with him, so not supposed to be her roommate. But instead of yelling at her, she agreed to something far more sinister though it is unclear whether Jeanette had in fact slept with Arthur Pavier or not. As the strike at the paint plants began to come to an end, several of the security guards and the motel employees hatched a scheme to teach Jeanette Chandler a lesson. It appears they viewed her with some really weird attitudes, some of, some of them viewing her as a conservative prude who didn't appreciate the men before her, others seeing her as a whore, and others seeing her as someone that they thought was looking down on them. 
And the fact that Jeanette had rejected James Nelson's advances just fueled this anger. Plus the rumors that Jeanette had been sleeping with people's boyfriends and people's crushes, it all just combined into one big rage. So they decided to teach her a lesson using sexual and physical violence. They planned to take Jeanette to the guest house where Arthur Paver had been staying to teach her, quote, some manners. On the 30th of January, 1979, Jeanette clocked on and began working the night shift at the motel. Everything on that shift went as it would have done during any other shift before. That was until sometime after midnight on the 31st of January, 1979. James Nelson, one of the security guards and another security guard called Robert Lynch, who we spoke about earlier, entered the Blue Mill Inn office where Jeanette had been working on the reception. The two security guards told Jeanette that there was a surprise party happening at Arthur Paver's place, the guest house at the paint plant. And they told Jeanette that they were gonna take her there for the party. When Jeanette stepped out from behind the front desk, James Nelson and Robert Lynch grabbed her and pinned her arms behind her back. They then restrained Jeanette with handcuffs and led her out of the office and into a waiting car. It's important to note that several of the security guards, including a guard called Anthony Williams and a group of female motel employees, watched Jeanette being shoved into the back seat of this waiting car by James Nelson and Robert Lynch from a balcony above the motel's office. After a few moments, James Nelson and Robert Lynch walked back into the motel with Jeanette locked in the back seat of the car. Robert Lynch, at just after 2 a.m., phoned the police and reported that a robbery had occurred at the motel. When the police arrived at the motel, Robert Lynch told the investigators that the night clerk, Jeanette Chandler, was missing. Now, it's unclear whether Robert Lynch and James Nelson drove Jeanette to the guest house before returning to the motel to phone for the police, or whether somebody else had driven her to the guest house. But what we do know is that when Jeanette arrived at the guest house, Arthur Paver held her captive until James Nelson and Robert Lynch returned. When the two security guards eventually returned to the guest house, the quote, party began. Over the course of the next few hours, at least 15 to 20 different people, including six female motel employees, gathered at the guest house for what unfolded. This included Jeanette's roommate and manager, Laurie Swank. Nearly all of these people, 15 to 20 people, either participated or witnessed the events that unfolded. Jeanette's eyes and mouth were covered in duct tape by one of the security guards. And Laurie Swank, Jeanette's roommate, would later tell the authorities that she knew Jeanette Chandler was going to be raped and killed. Arthur Paver began to rape Jeanette, shouting, quote, you're going to die, bitch, you're going to die. When he had finished, he encouraged other security guards to take turns raping Jeanette. One of these security guards, who was called Freddie Parker, took off his belt and wrapped it around Jeanette's neck as he raped her. James Nelson, Robert Lynch, and Freddie Parker used the belt to repeatedly choke Jeanette until she fell unconscious while they continued to beat and rape her. Another security guard, Anthony Williams, who was on the balcony when Jeanette was taken from the office, pledged himself as he watched Jeanette being raped. Anthony Williams further took part in choking Jeanette with the belt. Now I have skipped over a lot of the horrific and graphic details of what happened, and I've tried to only mention facts that are relevant to the case and facts that provide the most impactful account of the horror that these people put Jeanette through. Once this brutal and horrific attack on Jeanette came to an end, Robert Lynch choked her to death. Jeanette's roommate, Laurie Swank, watched as this happened, shouting verbal abuse at her. Following the murder of Jeanette, a mass panic spread throughout the guest house. The majority of the people in attendance pitched in to clean up the crime scene and destroy any evidence. Anthony Williams and Robert Lynch then wrapped Jeanette's body up in a sheet and put her in the boot of the car. Robert Lynch then drove about 40 miles south and dumped Jeanette's body in a snowdrift beside Interstate 196 in Van Boren County. The security guards, led by Arthur Paver, threatened the female motel workers and told them to keep quiet, telling them that if they ever mentioned anything about what had happened, they would get the same treatment that Jeanette had gotten. As we know, a snowplow driver discovered Jeanette's naked body 
the following day. Arthur Paver and the other security guards concocted a scheme which would see Robert Lynch falsely report the abduction of Jeanette to the police as a means to protect themselves. It is believed that this scheme was entirely premeditated and arranged before the murder ever took place. They also used several other methods in an attempt to protect themselves. They made sure to use condoms and made sure that they washed Jeanette's body after the murder to get rid of any kind of evidence that could be on it. They further chose in advance where they were going to dump her body some 14 miles away. Arthur Paver lied to the police in interviews following the discovery of Jeanette's body, categorically denying any knowledge of what had happened. Arthur Paver also forced his ex-girlfriend who had witnessed the rape and murder of Jeanette to provide a false alibi for him, threatening his ex-girlfriend with murder if she didn't comply. Arthur further threatened and forced Laurie Swank and a maid at the Blue Mill Inn to keep quiet and lie to the police to cover up what had happened. And if they didn't comply, he threatened to kill them. Arthur had even arranged for one of the security guards who had been tasked with photographing the strike at the paint plant to attend the rape and murder of Jeanette. He had this photographer security guard, who was called Ronald Wirick, to take photographs of the rape and murder, documenting all those present. In total, 24 rolls of film were used and given to Arthur Paver, all to be used as blackmail to silence those in attendance. Horrifyingly, Arthur Paver would go on to attend Jeanette Chandler's funeral. One of the security guards present would later testify that Wackenhut, the company providing these security guards, operated with a motto of, quote, I know nothing, see nothing, and speak only in kind words. An atmosphere of a code of silence was promoted at the company, and it appears that this company was aware of what had happened and just didn't want the scandal to be attached to the company's name. James Nelson actively covered up what had happened. He lied to the authorities and told them that he had been speaking with Jeanette on the phone and had overheard the abduction as it had happened, all in an attempt to hide the truth. As a result of James Nelson's account of being on the phone with Jeanette when she had been abducted, he quickly became a popular person with the police and with the media following the discovery of Jeanette's remains. Within two days of the rape and murder of Jeanette, Wackenhut's, quote, corporate office directed Arthur Paver to relocate himself and James Nelson to a Holiday Inn hotel to avoid media attention. And the case, for two decades, went cold. As we discussed, Robert Lynch would go on to live a decent life, and he used alcohol to try to forget what had happened on that night in 1979. And for 27 years, he believed he had gotten away with it. It's important to note that no statute of limitations for first-degree murder existed in Michigan at the time, and still doesn't, so it doesn't matter how much time had passed since the crime, people could still be prosecuted. And so, in February of 2006, after Robert Lynch's confession, he was charged with first-degree murder. And in September of 2006, the police had gathered enough evidence to charge Lurie Swank, Arthur Paver, Freddie Parker, James Nelson, and Anthony Williams with first-degree murder. Robert Lynch ended up pleading guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for his full confession. He received 25 to 40 years in prison. Arthur Paver, who had attended Jeanette's funeral along with Laurie Swank and James Nelson, insisted that he had no involvement in the crime whatsoever. Arthur, who was 54 years old at the time of the trial, claimed to have been elsewhere on the night of the murder. Quote, I can't believe that everyone that was supposedly there would say I was there. Arthur's ex-girlfriend, however, testified that she'd been forced to provide an alibi for Arthur, threatened by him with murder. Freddie Parker, who was 50 years old at the time and walked with a cane, also claimed to have not been involved. He claims that they had gotten the wrong guy and that he had moved back to his home in West Virginia nine days before the murder took place, though his ex-girlfriend testified against him, claiming that he had bragged about having sex with Jeanette on the night that she was murdered. James Nelson further denied being at the party, but admitted to a relationship with Jeanette. Anthony Williams also denied any involvement. Laurie Swank pled guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for her testimony, a charge which saw her being sentenced for 10 to 20 years behind bars. 
Laurie Swank's testimony placed Arthur Paver, Freddie Parker, James Nelson, and Anthony Williams at the crime scene. She was actually released on parole in 2016 and walks a free woman today. James Nelson was charged with first degree murder and sentenced to life behind bars on the 10th of December 2007. And on the 8th of June 2020, he passed away behind bars. Freddie Parker and Anthony Williams were sentenced to life in prison after being found guilty of first degree murder. Arthur Paver also received a life sentence on the charge of first degree murder. He passed away on the 13th of March 2013 behind bars. Only six out of the 15 to 20 people who had attended, witnessed and taken part in the rape and murder of Jeanette Chandler were ultimately prosecuted. True justice in this case has not been found, but we can only hope that Jeanette's family and friends have finally been able to find some peace. Thank you for watching this episode of my Curious Case series. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out on any future true crime videos. I upload a new video every Sunday. Thank you again to Ava's Manor for sponsoring this video. You can find a link to download the game in the description or at the top of the pinned comment. With all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.